Let's take our Bibles again. Let's look at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2 and verse number 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2 and verse number 13. I want to speak to you this morning about worldview and your faith in the Bible. Worldview and your faith in the Bible. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2 and verse number 13 says this. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, he received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Paul writing here to the church of Thessalonica and the Christians of Thessalonica said, I was so glad, I was so thankful to God that when we gave to you the word of God and preached to you the word of God, you received it not as being the words of men, but you received it for what it is. You received it as being the truth of God. You received it and accepted it that this is the word of God. And then, of course, because you had faith to believe it and so on, it affected a great change in your life. Listen, if, if you and I do not believe that the Bible is God's word and we don't accept it as such, we're, we're not going to have a biblical worldview. And it's so important, it's so foundational to uh, us and our children and, and the people around us having a biblical worldview that we must have confidence that the Bible is true. The Bible is truth. The Bible is God's words. It's not just uh, words that men wrote up that are good words and tell some good stories and, you know, this story is exaggerated, that never really happened. No, we must accept that it's true. It's the word of God. The miracles in the scriptures really did happen. Uh, the commands that God gives to us in His Word, they are truth. They are direct from God. They're what God desires for our life. We must believe that the Bible is the Word of God if it's going to be powerful and effective in our lives. We must believe the Bible is true and can be trusted if we are going to have a biblical worldview. I want you to pray with me and let's ask God to, to speak to our hearts today. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word that we can look to. And Lord, I'm here with great confidence and unshakable confidence today that the Bible is the word of God. And Lord, if there are some people that are uh, unsure about the Bible, they're not sure if they can place their confidence. I pray that today they might uh, be helped, uh, be convinced that the Bible is something that is reliable, something that can be trusted uh, in their life. Uh, Lord, we see people moving away from a biblical worldview, and sometimes it starts with the fact that they don't, they don't believe the Bible is the Word of God. And so God, help us first to get that matter settled, that the Bible is your Word. The Bible is a holy book. And it is the book from God, the God of heaven, our creator God. So Lord, help us today to have faith in the Bible, to trust in the reliability of the scriptures. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I want to share with you again something briefly from the American Worldview Inventory 2020. Their second report dealt with this topic of faith and worldview. The question was this, is the Bible true? Cultural Research Center, CRC, study finds that people's distrust or lack of faith in the Bible undermines its worldview, April 7th, 2020. The fact, as we mentioned last week, that just 6% of adults have a biblical worldview stems from some dramatic shifts in the relationships between people's faith and their worldview. The most incredible changes relate to, to how people view the Bible. What, what's their opinion about the Bible? A biblical worldview, by definition, is based upon belief in and application of the truth. So you've got to both, if you're going to have a biblical worldview, you believe in what the Bible says, and you're applying it to your life. It's affecting your behavior, how you live, and so on. But you believe in the Bible truths and principles and, and commands and exhortations that are contained in the Scriptures. However, the results of the 2020 survey point out that the change in people's perceptions and acceptance of the Bible have facilitated the continuing decrease in the number of people actually having a biblical worldview. You know, the Bible has been the best-selling book in, in, in the United States, the best-selling book in the United States for the past 50 years. Not, not, not that no copies are sold of, of any other book more than copies are sold of the Bible. 
Research suggests that there are more than 8 out of every 10 Americans that own at least one Bible. As many as 4 out of 10 adults claim to have read the entire Bible at some point in their life, 2 out of every 10 adults say that they read the Bible on a daily basis. Clearly, the Bible is a book that has had a lot of, a lot of presence uh, in, 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 in American culture, certainly. A lot of influence. And as you would expect, the survey revealed that people's beliefs about the Bible are directly correlated with whether or not they develop a biblical worldview. What you believe about the Bible really is going to have a big effect on whether you end up having a biblical worldview or not. For example, four out of every ten people, or 41% to be exact, believe that the Bible, they, they say they believe the Bible is the Word of God and it contains no factual or historical error, errors. One out of every seven of those adults, then, has a biblical worldview, 14%. Out of those people that believe they think it's the Bible is the Word of God, it has no errors, 14% of those people have a biblical worldview which that in itself is incredibly low. You would wonder why only 14% of those people, and there's reasons for that. We've talked some about that, and we will in the future. But while that percentage seems to be low, it's actually you know, more than double the national average of people that have a biblical worldview. Among the 13% of adults who believe the Bible is what they'd say is the inspired word of God, but it does contain some errors, only 2% of those people possess a biblical worldview. To say the Bible's God's Word, but it has, has a lot of errors in it. Those people are far less likely to end up having and living out a biblical worldview. Nearly one quarter of the nation possess a positive view or a positive opinion of the Bible, but they don't believe it's the literal or inspired Word of God, that it's, that it's accurate. They see it as just another holy book of religious teachings and that it can be a good guidebook for, for society and so on and for relationships. But those people that have a, have a lower opinion of God's word, if you will, well, those people, only 1% of them have a biblical worldview. One out of eight American adults, or 13%, are, are uh, considered to be indifferent to or dismissive of the Bible, citing it as merely a descriptive narrative of how its authors viewed the ways and principles of God, or as an unrealistic book of fables and myths and just a bunch of stories. Not quite 1%, less than 1% of the people in that category would hold to a biblical worldview. The remaining 9% of the general public are those that uh, do not ha know how to describe the nature of the va or value of the Bible. And again, less than 1% of that segment would have a biblical worldview. Describing uh, the, these, these statistics and so on differently, only half of the nation's adult population, or 54%, believes that the Bible is the Word of God. Even fewer, just 4 out of 10, 41%, uh, believe that the Bible is totally true in all of its statements. Stunningly, when comparing the current data uh, with that from 2000, so 20 years ago, there's been a 21 percentage point decline in the proportion of adults who believe the Bible is the Word of God. 75% of all Americans believe the Bible is the Word of God 20 years ago. And now only 54%. Just 20 years later, believe the Bible is the Word of God. And there's a 17% uh, drop in the number who believe the Bible is without error. It's, it's not surprising then that you would find different segments of what is considered to be Christian population that have varying degrees of, of, uh, of a biblical worldview. For example, the 13% of Americans who attend what is considered to be evangelical churches Congregations who teach that the Bible is the Word of God, that it's reliable, that it's trustworthy in all its matters, they have the, light, the, the highest likelihood of being integrated disciples, people that have a biblical worldview. They, their, their belief and their behavior match up to the Bible. Overall, more than four out of five people, 84% of those associated with evangelical churches, contend or believe that the Bible is the Word of God. And three-quarters of those at such churches believe that the Bible has no errors. One out of five people at evangelical churches are considered, though, to be integrated disciples. That bothers me as well. How can, and I, we understand that all kinds of people can come into churches like ours and other, you know, Bible-believing churches or whatever. And churches that teach that the Bible is the Word of God, people that would say they believe the Bible is the Word of God, 
But then when you start to discuss with people or ask people what they believe about certain things and how they behave about certain things, it doesn't agree with the Bible. That makes no sense. How can we say we believe the Bible is the Word of God, but then just not follow it? Not, not, not really, well, in part it's because we don't read it. People don't study it. People don't come to church as faithfully as maybe they did generations ago. They're not learning God's truth. They're not studying God's truth. They're not applying it in their life. They're being conformed to the world rather than being transformed by the word. Among the 180 million adults in America who say that they are Christian, less than one out of 10 people, only 9% has a biblical worldview. Born again, uh, born again Christians are one-third of the population. In, in this stat comes from the USA. One-third of the USA claims to be born-again Christians. These people were not identified as such by self-identification, but by claiming to be Christian and to believe that they will experience heaven after they die because they've realized their sinfulness and accepted Jesus alone as their Savior. Although this group is often described as the backbone of the Christian church, Less than one out of five of them actually have a biblical worldview when it comes to their beliefs and their practice. A figure that is incredibly low, but yet it was triple the national average of just 6%. Individuals who fall within the realm of being spiritual skeptics. Those people that are atheists or agnostics or those with no religious interests or affiliation at all. Spiritual, spiritual skeptics, we could call them people of no faith. They actually constitute the fastest growing faith segment in the nation. Isn't that amazing? Those with no faith are actually the fastest growing faith group uh, statistically in America. That those with no faith is growing faster than those with faith. They currently represent more than one out of every five American adults. As expected, given that fact that they dismiss and reject the Bible and Christianity... Less than one half of 1%. So 0 0.5, less than that, even had any kind of biblical worldview in, in what they stated were some of their beliefs and so on. What's the challenge for the future? The weak linkage between Bible appreciation and church affiliation and biblical worldview raised concerns for George Barner, director of research at the Cultural Research Center. He wrote this in his comments. This study shows that people in their teens and 20s so teenagers and young adults in their 20s read the Bible less often than other adults. They attend church less often and they're more likely to attend churches that reject the authority of the Bible. Young people are also less likely than older adults to believe that the Bible is the word of God and that it is true. As we look to the coming decades, we should be concerned that adults under the age of 30 are both the least likely, likely to have a biblical worldview and to engage uh, Christianity through churches that believe the Bible is the true word of God. To reverse the declining numbers of people with a biblical worldview, we must get back to teaching the authority of the scriptures, the primacy of the word of God in our lives, and the accountability to our creator God. George Barner wrote this, people do what they believe. Th this research underscores the fact that growing numbers of people are moving away from believing that the Bible is true and relevant and valuable for our lives. Christian churches cannot keep doing what they've been doing in ministry for the past 30 years and assuming that things will get better. The consequences of our ineffective ministry strategies is obvious. Americans have embraced alternative worldviews that are destroying our country on every front. Parents and churches must deliberately and strategically work hand in hand with each other, as well as with schools, to rescue America from the moral and spiritual freefall that we're in. God provided his words of life in the Bible for our well-being. Time is short, and we must immediately join together in a concerted effort to restore his truth and wisdom to our lives. People must be immersed in studying the Bible and taught to think and live according to the biblical worldview. Now, I read that to you, and what, what is the obvious to me? What, what is the obvious conclusion in this? You and I will not have a biblical worldview if you and I don't have faith and confidence in the Bible. If our young people, or you yourself, if you don't have confidence and trust that the Bible uh, is, is the Word of God, then you're not going to live out a biblical worldview. 
You're not going to practice what the Bible says. You're not going to live what the Bible teaches. You won't have a biblical worldview if you don't even trust the Bible. You don't trust the word of God. If you don't believe the Bible is the very words of God, then it won't change much about the way that you think and live. So I want to share with you today, from the oldest to the youngest, I want to share with you today, what, what are some reasons why you can have faith in the Bible? We're seeing that it's a real issue in society and even an issue in churches. That there are a lot of people, they don't trust the Bible. They don't believe the Bible. I'm here to tell you this morning, you can trust the Bible. You can trust God's Word. I believe I hold in my hands a book this morning that was inspired by God and even per preserved by God for us today without error. It's a book you can build your life upon, build your family upon. It's a book that can guide you in life and you can follow it and your life will be blessed. You can trust God's Word. I believe that with all my heart. So I want to share with you quickly five reasons this morning why you can have faith in the Bible, why the Word of God is reliable, why the Word of God can be trusted. Number one, because of the divine character of the author. Because of the divine character of the author. Uh, this, this comes from a doctrinal class that I studied a lot of this. Numbers 23 and verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie. Uh, 1 Samuel 15, 29, the strength of Israel will not lie. Psalm 89, 35, once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. Romans 3, 4, let God be true and every man a liar. Titus 1 and verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie. Hebrews 6, 18, in which it was impossible for uh, God to lie. Do you know there's one thing that God cannot do? We sometimes sing a song with the kids, God can do anything, anything, and that's true, He can do anything. But He can't lie. He cannot lie. God always tells the truth. God's Word is always truthful. God is truth. God's Word is truth. The Bible speaks about uh, Jesus Christ in John 1, 14, and it says this, calls Him the Word. I believe that Jesus was the living word of the Bible. We've got you know, the written word of God. Speaks this about the truth, speaks this about the word, speaks this about Jesus and says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Truth. Truth is just what, what God is. It's a part of his holy divine character, his, his nature. Part of his divine character is that God is always truthful. God cannot tell a lie. God doesn't tell a fib. God doesn't exaggerate. Uh, God is always totally honest. He's truthful. God's character can be trusted. He's truthful. He's truthful. But I also want you to know he's holy. He's holy. And because God is holy, this is also a holy book. It's a holy book. The Bible we believe with all of our heart is the Word of God. I believe that God is the author of the Bible. It says right here on the side, Holy Bible, but it's true. It's not just written there for, for a fact, man. It's true. God is holy. God's Word is holy. The divine character of the author of this book gives credibility to the content of this book. The reason that it's called Holy Bible is because the character of the author is holy. In Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 3, Isaiah the prophet saw the Lord seated upon the throne and he heard, heard the angels saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. He's holy. Uh, Revelation chapter 4 and verse 8, John the apostle saw the Lord seated upon the throne and he heard the angels, Holy, holy, holy. Heard that resounding through the heavens. You can put your confidence in the Bible today. You can trust what the Word of God says because the divine character of the author is always truthful and holy. Truthful and holy. God is truthful and holy. His Word is truthful and holy. It can be trusted. That, that's one reason why you can put your confidence in this book because God is always truthful and God is always holy. So what are some reasons this morning? Why you can have faith in the Bible. Why the Word of God is reliable. Why the Word of God can be trusted. Why it can be trusted. Number one, because of the divine character of the author. 
You go off to school or you go off to some university and somebody tries to make fun of the Bible and tell you you can't trust the Bible. It's just, it's, it's just the words of men. Don't you believe them. Let God be true and every man a liar. God does not lie. God cannot lie. It's impossible for God to lie. God is truthful and God is holy. And because of the divine character of the author, you can trust this book. Let me give you a second reason. Because of the Bible's prophetic accuracy. Because of the Bible's prophetic accuracy. In Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had a great dream that was about future world powers or future world kingdoms. Earthly kingdoms that would end up overthrowing Babylon and then overthrowing the next uh, power and so on. The dream was interpreted by Daniel, the prophet of God. His interpretation of what world powers would, su would succeed Babylon was accurate. And it's a matter of historical record that Babylon was a world power in that time. But Babylon was succeeded by the kingdom of, of Medo-Persia. And then Medo-Persia was succeeded by the kingdom of Greece. And then Greece was succeeded by the kingdom of Rome. Rome was divided and there was two capitals. We've seen in history these empires that have conquered previous empires. And just as it was prophesied in the book of Daniel, and, 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 and Daniel uh, explained, explained it and so on, that's exactly what came true. The prophecies of Scripture have always been very, very accurate. Why can we trust the Bible? Why can we trust that it's reliable, that you can put your faith in it, that these, these young people can believe that, hey, the Bible's the Word of God. It's not something to be tossed aside. Here's a good reason. Because of the Bible's prophetic accuracy. Not only was this historically accurate, what took place, but it was prophetically accurate. You know, Daniel was written in the 6th century B.C., meaning that it was pred predicted while well, Babylon was the world power and before any of these succeeding empires uh, came into power. Before there was ever an Alexander the Great, the Bible prophesied that there would be a great uh, a Greece uh, empire uh, ruling the world. The Bible predicted that. You know, any man, if they're truthful, could write an accurate history book by looking back at what's already happened in time. But only God can write an accurate prophecy by looking ahead to what will happen in time to come. There are many, many other examples of a consistent and precise and exact fulfillment of prophecies where the things that happened in our world were fulfilled exactly how the Word of God had said it would. Fulfilled prophecy makes the Scriptures reliable. You can trust God's Word. Stephen, you can trust the Bible. You can put your faith in the Bible. You can trust God's Word. You can believe in it. You can know that what is written in this book, that it is truth. It is God's Word for you. And it was God's Word uh, 2,000 years ago. It's still God's Word today. It'll be God's Word next year and the year after that until He tarries His coming and forever. God's Word will stand forever. You can trust God's Word. You can believe in it. What are some reasons why you can have faith in the Bible? Why the Word of God is reliable? Why the Word of God can be trusted? Number one, because of the divine character of the author. He's, he's always truthful and holy. Number two, because of the Bible's prophetic accuracy. Number three, because the history of the Bible is very accurate. The history... The history recorded in the Bible is, is very accurate with, with other accounts as well. Not that we need the other accounts to, to validate it, but they do. The history of the Bible is very accurate. Historians used to laugh at the Bible references to the Hittites saying that there never w was such a people. And then archaeologist Hugo Winkler uncovered the capital of the Hittite Empire. You know, when my, when my wife and I had the opportunity to visit the Holy Land, we saw places where archaeological discoveries are really just revealing things in great accuracy and agreement with the historical accounts and references made in the Scriptures. When they start digging, digging, and doing all these archaeological digs and so on, it is proving that the history and the things recorded in the Bible are true. That there really was a Jericho. That the walls of Jericho really did fall down. When they did some digging in that area, they found that uh, the walls did not, um, the walls, what am I going to say here? That the walls fell out and not in. You know, you would think that if, 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 if 
man had attacked Jericho and man's schemes had attacked Jericho, they would, they would be battering the walls from the outside and doing different things and to knock the walls down in on the people, in on Jericho, the city they're trying to conquer. They wouldn't make the walls fall down upon themselves, fall outward. But the fact of the walls falling outward is another sure sign that, that it was God who did a miracle. All Joshua did and all the people did was walk around the walls of Jericho and blow their trumpets and praise God, and just like the Bible records it. And God made the walls of Jericho to fall out. The walls of the city fall in. Listen, the Bible is a very historically accurate book. You can have confidence that the Bible is the Word of God. It is true. It can be trusted. We won't take time to do so today, but if you were to do some research, you would find that there are many, many uh, archaeological digs that reveal things talked about in the Scriptures. And this proves to us the reliability and the trustworthiness of the Bible. What are some reasons today, Tony and Paul... Colin and Caleb, Timothy and Praisey, Catherine and Karen. What are some reasons, Stephen and Jenna, what are some reasons that you can have faith in the Bible and trust that the Word of God is reliable and trust that the Bible, it's truly God's Word. Why can you trust it? Number one, because of the divine character of the author. Number two, because of the Bible's prophetic accuracy. Number three, because the history of the Bible is very accurate. Number four, because facts of science agree with the Bible. Facts of science agree with the Bible. There are proven scientific facts that have been proven true as man has learned more and more about this world that God created. Man has learned a lot about science uh, in the last uh, 100 years and so on. And those things that are proven and true scientific facts and not uh, uh, hypotheticals and theories of man, but the, the true and proven scientific facts have always agreed with the scriptures and things that are even spoken about thousands of years ago. The Bible agrees with the facts and science does not contradict what the Word of God says. For example, biology. Biology agrees with the Bible. In Leviticus chapter 17 and verse uh, 11 it says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood. That was written thousands of years ago. If a person was not feeling well and went to the doctor, and the diagnosis was early signs of arthritis, uh, would they be overly concerned or worried about their life in the sense of it being fatal? No, not necessarily. If a person was not feeling well, though, and they went to the doctor... And the diagnosis was early signs of leukemia, a blood disease. Would they be concerned or worried about their life? Yes, they would. Because, as the scripture said, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Physical life depends upon the blood. It's essential to life. And the word of God spoke to that thousands of years ago. Things that scientists have just learned in, in modern times, in modern day. The Bible spoke to that thousands of years ago. Ashley, is that story about George Washington true? You think it's true from your research? Ashley loves history and, and, and so on. It is, it's widely accepted that George Washington had an infection. And the doctors, what they did was they attempted to bleed the disease out of him. They thought, well, we can bleed this disease out of his body. But they actually harmed his life. Why? Because the Bible taught thousands of years before that the life of the flesh is in the blood. Science has learned and discovered much more in the last hundred years that man didn't understand before. But there are things the Bible spoke about a long time ago. And science has just learned in, in recent years. What about geography? Geography agrees with the Bible. In Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 22, it says this. It is he, it is he that sitteth upon uh, the, the circle of or the circuit of the earth. I'm not sure what word he's in by the circle maybe or a circuit. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. Many people attempted to persuade Christopher Columbus that he should not sail to the new world because they thought that the earth was flat. They thought that he would sail right off the end of the map. They thought that he would fall off into an abyss. Maps in those days were drawn showing the world as being flat. But the Bible taught long before those maps were drawn that the earth was a circle, that the earth was, was a globe. Now, there is nothing in the Bible that suggests the world was flat. 
You know, isn't it reasonable that the one who created the world would know what shape it is? But man just discovered it. Man just figured it out in modern times. But geography agrees with the Bible. Here's another example. Zoology agrees with the Bible. Zoology agrees with the Bible. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 30 says, A lion which is strongest among beasts. The king of the beasts, the king of the jungle, was named the strongest before it was ever known by modern zoologists. The Bible spoke to the fact that the lion is, is king of the jungle. The lion uh, is, is, is strongest among beasts. Meteorology agrees with the Bible. Meteorology agrees with the Bible. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verses 5 to 7 says this, The sun also ariseth, and the sun goeth down. And hasteth uh, to his place, or to his place where he arose. The wind goeth toward the south, and turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again unto, uh, according to his circuits. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. All of the things about meteorology, all the things about the weather patterns and the, the wind patterns and so on, like you can see if, you, if, you, if you're into that kind of stuff, all of, all of the description of winds coming from the north and how they make their patterns. The Bible talked about that. How the, the rivers, they flow down from the mountains and so on, eventually into the sea, but then water evaporates and more clouds and water goes into the mountains again and snow comes in the mountains. All of this, listen, the Bible spoke to that before meteorologists and, and scientists and so on had figured all that stuff out. What are some reasons why you can have faith in the Bible? Why the Word of God is reliable and why the Word of God can be trusted? Number one, because of the divine character of the author of the Bible. He is trustworthy. God is always truthful. God is holy. And you can trust His Word. Number two, why is the Bible trustworthy? Why is it reliable? Why can you put your faith in it? Because of the Bible's prophetic accuracy. It's prophetic accuracy to speak about things before they ever happen. And be accurate. Be right. Why can the Bible be trusted? Because the history of the Bible is very accurate. The history of the Bible is very accurate. Number four, we said, because facts of science agree with the Bible. Why can the Bible be trusted? Why is it reliable? Facts of science agree with the Bible. And here's number five. What are some reasons why you can have faith in the Bible? Why the Word of God is reliable? Why the Word of God can be trusted? Number five. Because of the testimony of people changed by the Bible. Because of the testimony of people whose lives have been changed by the Bible. The message that Peter and John and the other apostles were preaching began to be called into question by the religious rulers in Jerusalem. Turn with me to the book of Acts and I want you to, to see something there. People began to question their message. They did not like these men preaching about the saving power of Jesus Christ. The one who was crucified and buried and risen again. The Jewish religious rulers demanded to know by what power the impotent man who had sat at the gate beautiful had been healed on the previous day. Acts chapter number 4. The disciples were determined that they were, they were not going to be silenced. They were not going to be censored. They were not going to be shut up in speaking that it was in the power of Jesus' name that this man had been healed. It wasn't any hocus pocus or miraculous power on their own part. It was God. It was power of Jesus, the power of Jesus' name that had allowed that man to be healed. And with the healed man there standing at their side, they could say nothing against it. They couldn't argue it. How can you argue with that? With the testimony of a changed life. Look what the Bible says in Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Acts 4 and verse 1, look at this story. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the uh, Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold, uh, put them in, in, in chains perhaps, and locked them up until the next day, for it was now eventide. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of them was about 5,000. Man, some of these religious people that weren't believing in Christ, they didn't like all these people getting saved. They didn't like all these people believing in Jesus and believing in the, this preaching about the power of Jesus and his, his death and burial and resurrection and so on. Verse 5, it says, And it came to pass on the morrow that the rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have ye done this? Then Peter, 
filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom he crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. In other words, the chief cornerstone. Verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed, standing with them, they could say nothing against it. They could maybe try to argue about the beliefs, but they couldn't argue about this changed life. Verse 15. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a, a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. Look, look everybody can see that there's been a miracle. Here's something happened. Everybody can see it. We can't deny that. Verse 17. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in, in, the, in this name. And they called them and called them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. People may argue your beliefs but they cannot argue with the testimony of a life that's been changed by the Word of God. When people start to hear and see the testimony of thousands and thousands of people whose lives have been changed through the power of Jesus Christ, through the message of God's Word, then it will be difficult for them to refute it. They won't be able to say anything. It, it, it is difficult to deny its credibility and its reliability and its authenticity. When literally thousands upon thousands of people begin testifying, not only verbally with their lips, but by their life and by the change that God's made in their life, and they show the world of God's power. And they're showing the world that this is what Jesus has done in my life. This is how Jesus changed me. You know, the story of John Newton, and we get to sing the song Amazing Grace. You know what that testimony shows? The power of God's grace. The power of Jesus Christ to change the life. That John Newton, a man who was stubborn and rebellious and went his own way, he was living like a heathen man, he was living as a wicked man, he was a slave trader, he was a wicked man going totally the wrong direction. But then God changed his life. Jesus changed his life. And he'd write, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear. Listen, people can't argue with your testimony. People could argue over what you believe or, or whatever, but they can't argue with your testimony. They can't argue when they see a life that's changed by the power of the gospel and by the power of Jesus Christ. And, and I say this, may God help us. To be people that are different from the world. That there is such a, a difference, such a change in our life. Because we know the Lord Jesus Christ. That they can't argue with that. And it is the testimony. Over the last 2,000 years. Of lives changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thousands and thousands and millions of lives have been changed by the gospel. It also proves to us that the Bible is something that can be trusted. You can put your faith in it. This is a living book, a powerful book. It's the Word of God. It has the power to change lives. The Gospel has the power to, to save souls and change the life of a, uh, of a sinner and change the life of a drunkard and change the life of an abuser and change them into somebody who honors God and lives for Jesus Christ and becomes a different person. Testimony of a changed life gives validity to the power of the Word of God and the truth of God's Word. In Scriptures, we can look at the life of Saul as somebody, someone who was changed by the power of Christ. He went from being a persecutor of Christians to being a follower of Christ himself. You know what the only explanation is? The power of Christ. 
the power of Christ. And many people around us, we can hear the testimony and see the life of people who have been changed by Jesus Christ and the Word. I'm thankful that in my life we do go back a certain number of generations that it was people that knew Christ and knew the gospel and knew the Lord Jesus Christ. But somewhere in my family tree, you know, we went from being, you know, barn burners and, and terrorists and, and wicked people or whatever we were to being people who knew God and had faith in God and had faith in Jesus Christ. People whose lives were changed by the word of God. You may be the first in your generation. But whether you're the first in your generation or the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, whatever, in, in generations of, of Christians in your, in, your life, in your family, may there be such a, a life change in you that it's a testimony to the power of Christ and the power of the Word of God and the truthfulness of God's Word that this book can change people's lives. When we submit to the God of this book and follow the God of this book and believe in the, the Savior, Jesus Christ, of this book, He changes lives. There's great power in a testimony. Something that can't be argued against. The testimonies of lives changed by the power of God's word proves to us the reliability of the scriptures. You can trust the Bible. Stephen, you can trust the Bible. You can believe the Bible. You can believe that the Bible is the word of God. And you can put your faith in it. You can put your confidence in it. You can trust the Bible. Here are some reasons why you can have faith in the Bible. Why the Word of God is reliable and why the Word of God can be trusted. Number one, because of the divine character of the author of the Bible. He is always truthful and he is holy. Number two, why can you trust it? Because of the Bible's prophetic accuracy. Why can you trust it? Number three, because the history of the Bible is very accurate. Why can you believe in it? Number four, because facts of science agree with the Bible. Why can you trust in it? Why can you put your confidence in this book that it is God's word? Because of the testimony of people changed by the Bible. The testimony of people whose lives have been changed by the word of God. Let's sing it together. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God. The B-I-B-L-E. Let's sing it together. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God. The B-I-B-L-E. Bible. Let me sing it with you like we do many times in our family. Something we've done in devotions. We'll start again with that and we'll sing a few more courses and if you know some of them, join in and sing them with us, okay? The B-I-B-L-E Yes, that's the book for me I stand alone on the word of God The B-I-B-L-E The Bible will never fail Never fail Never fail The Bible will never fail No, no, no no, give me a note here. Note I, I, I have a wonderful treasure, the gift of God without measure. And so we travel together, my Bible and I. Get the new look from the old book. Get the new look from the Bible. Get the new look from the old book. Get the new look from God's Word. The inward look. The outward look, the upward look from the old, old book. Get the new look from the old book. Get the new look from God's Word. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God. The B-I-B-L-E. Bible! And that's how kids learn to do it in Sunday school, right? Shout it out. Bible! Amen. You can trust the Bible. You can have confidence that the Bible is the Word of God. Don't you go away from it. Trust this book. Tony and Paul and Lillian and James and Rebecca and Zoe. Hey, believe that the Bible is the Word of God and build your faith upon it. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us a book that is reliable, that is true, that can be trusted. Help us to, to have an unshakable confidence in the Word of God, no matter what the world may say. No matter if some criticize it, help us to believe and trust that the Bible is your word, God. And it's for us. And help us to uh, believe in it, live by it, follow it, day by day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you.